So welcome to the Institute for Government. Uh, if you have been enjoying the nice three-week Brexit break, uh, apologies for bursting your bubble. But the good news is we're not going to be talking about parliamentary votes or customs unions. We get to talk about the part of the economy and our relationship with the EU that's actually quite important and has been, well, has gone under the radar slightly over the last few years, and that is services. So hopefully our panel will be able to shed some light on what they think Brexit will mean for their industries uh, and what, the, what has happened over the last two years. Um, but before I introduce the panel, firstly, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Joe Owen. I'm a programme director at the Institute for Government. You can follow the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag IFGBrexit, which should up, be up behind me. Um, we've got just over an hour, um, so get your questions ready because we will coming to the floor about halfway through. But then formally, just before I, before I introduce the panel, I just want to say thank you to Burgess Salmon, who are our partners for today's event, and their partner, Ian. Ian Tucker is going to say a few words as introductory remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Joe, and thank you very much to everyone for coming. Um, I'm delighted to be here and delighted to be teaming up with Institute for Government on this, um, particularly on this issue, actually. Uh, speaking as a lawyer, I suppose it's close to heart. Um, but more importantly, as Joe says, services is the, the most important part of the debate that hasn't really been heard. Um, people know about these, these figures, but just to remind everyone, services, 80% of our economy. 277 billion pounds of service exports, which leads to a surplus compared to the deficit in goods. Surplus, uh, dangerous to get into too much statistics, but surplus is about 107 billion, of which 25 billion is surplus with the EU. 50% of that approximately is financial and um, professional services. And about 42 billion is what I'm going to call regulated services. Those are services that require some sort of local approval, some sort of local qualification, and the kind of thing which is going to be particularly affected if those are no longer available to us. Um, we've got a number of panelists here who can speak better for themselves than I can, but um, you know, we're talking about a legal services market, which is the second biggest in the world, 640 billion pounds. Um, that's about 6.5% of global revenue. We've got one of the largest insurance markets in the world. We want to be a tech uh, services exporter. Um, and that's not to mention the big one, the financial services, where we are the country in the world with the biggest net uh, exports for financial services. All of that has not really featured very heavily, I think we'd probably agree, in the debate to, uh, so far. And I, I kind of guess that might be because it's kind of easy to visualize Dover with a lot of trucks. It's easy to visualize the problems with getting meat across a border in Northern Ireland. It's much less easy to visualize what the impact on somebody providing professional advice to Germany or financial uh, capital location actually means. But of course, that may not be so sort of photogenic, shall we say, on day one, but it's gonna be from that point onwards exceedingly important. You know, if, if our services industry takes a, a blow, and there are various figures, ne um, reasonably credible assessments, maybe 17 billion impact over a number of years. That is something which actually hits a lot of people and a lot of uh, employment. Um, if we leave the EU, and this isn't really a deal or no deal question, this is leaving the EU, we become a third party for services. That means we lose the current mutual recognition, and those regulated services that I've been talking about earlier are the ones that you now have to deal not with the EU, but with each of the 27 member states, who in many cases have a breakdown of their local requirements. You need to get approved, the right certifications, the right qualifications to practice, to act in each of those. And that means in some places it's a criminal offence to turn up and provide services as a professional in parts of Germany if you don't hold the local uh, requirement. And sometimes that requires a citizenship or a, um, a local qualification to do. So these are sort of quite serious restrictions that we're talking about. They're not really tariff restrictions. They're not really about tax. They're about non-tariff barriers. And again, that might be one reason why it hasn't featured so highly, I guess, in the debate so far, is that these are talking not so much about easy to understand percentage rates, but blocks that are soft, hard to see. If we go to WTO terms, 
they don't really deal with services desperately well. I think most people would agree. GATS exists. That's a general um, agreement in trade and services. And is OK for some co-location or some relocation, which, of course, is sending business abroad, um, but is not very good at all for cross-border services. There has been some progress on the trade and <coughs> services agreement, TISA, but that isn't really in force. It's a plurilateral agreement anyway, so it's only a limited number of parties. GPA, Government Procurement Agreement, is brilliant that the UK is in that. That's fantastic and exceedingly important, but it doesn't cover all services, uh, only a limited number. And if we want FTAs, well, that's a novel ground for services. The Canada FTA doesn't really have anything in services. Most of the, the world FTAs don't, free trade agreements. Uh, you hear that as being the solution. Well, if we're going to negotiate a services chapter to a free trade agreement of a serious sort, that will be novel ground and probably take a while to do. So um, services is a particularly UK issue, and it's a particularly challenging one. Um, it's obviously important to talk about and possibly hasn't featured part of the debate, and I look forward to hearing lots of interesting comments on it today. Thank you, Joe. Brilliant. So the panel for today, uh, on my far left, we have Giles Derrington, who is Associate Director for Policy at Tech UK, the trade body for the UK's digital industry. Next to Giles, there's Elisa Kerr, a Managing Director at State Street, where she is Head of Legal and Global Credit Finance and Global Link with Europe, Middle East and Africa. State Street are a big US bank and one of the large asset management, largest asset management companies in the world. To my right, we have Adam Mins, Head of Commercial Broadcasters Association, which is the, uh, which is the very important trade body in the audiovisual sector, whose member includes, members include some of the world's biggest media groups. And then on my far right, we have Emma Dowden, Chief Operating Officer at Burgess Salmon, who you've just heard from Ian about. So, the first question that I wanted to get started on was around No Deal, and what it was actually like in the run-up to the 29th of March and then the 12th of April. We heard a lot about parliamentary votes and a potential shortage on the shelves for food or ferries, but much less about how the services sector was preparing for no deal, the risks involved. Were there big red buttons for contingency plans that people were waiting to hit, had already hit, or just wanted to avoid hitting altogether? So I'll start with you, Giles. How are your members preparing for No Deal? What did No Deal mean to your members and what advice were you giving them? So I think there's a, there's a number of elements to this. So first of all, I mean, one of the problems with tech is tech sort of covers every industry because it's actually an underpinning method of delivering services. So there's quite a lot of differentiation between our members because those, for example, serving financial services were really worried about things like passporting. So they'd already done a lot of contingency planning, whereas some that are more delivering, you know, uh, CRM systems. It's a fundamentally different types of things that they were worried about. I think the kind of key uh, kind of cross cutter was data flows and so we had a lot of our largest members and our medium sized members spending millions of pounds, hundreds of thousands of hours effectively reviewing every contract they've ever written to make sure that it was compliant for a standard contractual clause to continue to allow the free flow of data uh, across the UK EU border and that was the kind of key thing that a lot of them were doing. I think the challenge is on the smaller end, they simply did not have the legal uh, support to do so, uh, didn't really necessarily know where to start. And so what we saw in our survey data was you know, the startup scale up end of the tech sector really was going, we'll wait and see what happens. I think mean, one other thing I'd say is that uh, we had members talking to us about just how close to the line they got to doing very, very big things. I, had, uh, I remember the weekend before the, the, the 29th of March, and people call me saying, but is this going to happen or not? Because we need to make a decision on Monday whether to move massive amounts of our staff like, you know, almost next week uh, and literally hovering over a big red button. So that challenge still exists. You know, you know, we're having a nice little Brexit hiatus at the moment, but uh, October 31st is not very far away, certainly in business terms. And the thing you're increasingly seeing now is uh, particularly big US uh, firms or international uh, tech firms going, there's only so many times we're going to prepare for no deal again. And actually, we can't get uh, you know, California or Tokyo or wherever to sign another big contingency check if we need to. So you need to, A, tell us a lot, you know, long time before October whether you're going to extend uh, again. And B, if you get there, we can't guarantee that we're going to treat this as, as a 
how do we rescue our UK element of our market rather than just saying, you know what, you guys have become a basket case. And Adam is another group with members. Were your members hovering over big red buttons, as Giles said? or Probably about three months before um, the end of March because that they need a certain length of time to actually um, get their sort of contingency plans in place. But yeah. let me just, can I just do a bit of background first? I mean, um, so Cobra represents a whole range of different broadcasters, domestic and international, but the companies in the firing line in this context are the international channels. And, and by that, I mean, the UK has got about 1,200 channels that are licensed by the UK regulator based here. But of those, around half are broadcasting not to UK homes, but into the EU. Um, it's in a, in an arrangement similar to passporting in the financial services. Uh, if you have a license from one member state, you're allowed to broadcast to any other member state. So obviously, the, the key word there is member states. And once you're no longer part of the EU, then that license is not valid. And so you have to apply to another EU member state to get a license from them. So three months before the, um, the, the, the end of March, those companies will start that, have to start that process because it takes that long to, not just to go through all the bureaucracy of getting the license, but you may have to recomply your channel according to the local rules. Uh, you will probably have to move at least some staff into that country to support that channel. Um, so that, that started about three months out, and it's, it's still going on, to be honest. Um, I mean, I think most COBA members now have uh, are, are well advanced in applying for their licenses in the EU. No one wanted to do that. They left it to the, as late as possible because they, everyone's in the UK for a good reason. They want to be here. They want to invest here. But you, equally, you need a license to be, uh, to be legal in, in the EU. So... Uh, most of them are well advanced in that process. Um, I think the question now is what that means in terms of resources, and by that I mean staff and investment in infrastructure to support those licenses. And I think that will, at the moment it's a trickle into other EU member states. The question is in years to come um, whether that becomes something uh, bigger. And Elisa, as a kind of representing a big US bank in the UK, what what questions were being asked of you in the run-up to the 29th of March? What kind of messages were you having to send back to headquarters about what no deal could mean and how you would need to respond? Well, I guess financial institutions by their nature are big and clunky. Um, it takes a long time to move people and assets and resources to different jurisdictions. Um, the system under which we currently operate is passporting. Um, so that means that we can go to our national competent authority here in the UK. Um, once we get the necessary approvals there, that allows us to passport currently financial services across uh, the rest of the EU 27 bloc without a lot in the degree of formalities, without having to set up separately capitalised subsidiaries in other member states. So uh, with the cusp of Brexit, you're trying to make decisions as to how you would continue to service clients outside the UK um, in the knowledge that that passporting or that mutual recognition is likely to fall away. Um, one of the main ways to do that is to set up in another EU state. And of course, the, that, that's a long dated process. It takes a long time um, uh, to find office space, uh, to move people across, to, to move assets across. So a, a lot of financial institutions will have had to make that contingency planning from a long time out. Um, so you will have seen institutions move, move to Ireland, um, move to Paris, move to Luxembourg, move to Germany. Um, you'll have heard institutions like, like JP Morgan saying in September last year that for their asset management business, they'd reached a point of no return. They had to pull the trigger. Mm. Um, so I think there was a, a certain amount of decision making that had already been made for t contingency purposes to make sure that you, there was a degree of financial stability. But there, is, there was still last minute decisions as to, you know, do we pull the trigger now, do we not? Um, if we can only have one platform operating in, in one country, when, when is the switch over date? When is the movement of people? Um, and I think there, there's a general uh, uh, review of your business as a whole, how it operates, what the nature of that business is, how passive or active it is, um, how many clients you have outside the UK in different uh, European countries. So there's a lot of work around if you were 
able to continue to service those clients from the UK, so things like reverse solicitation in certain countries, um, in, in, in Luxembourg and Liechtenstein, when, when clients might come to you and ask you if, if you can provide the services for them, or, or various other exemptions, so safe harbours that exist in, in Ireland, or de minimis exceptions that might exist in, in Sweden. Um, or if you're not actively providing uh, services in, say, say, France or Italy, you might come under a sort of a no activities exemption in those kind of countries. Um, the other situation that we can potentially look to is, is Brexit-type legislation that other European uh, member states are putting into place. Um, Germany's looking at it, many states are looking at it. In fact, Spain is the only country so far to have actually uh, enacted it. So it's, it's quite a difficult basis on which to rely at this stage when things are very much in draft. Mm. Um, but again, we're having to make those decisions as to whether it works going forward. Um, the other option for, for financial services, if you can't either move to another state or you can't get under an exemption, it, is to halt services. So not great for stability, but that is a decision constantly on, on people's minds. Yeah. And Emma is Chief Operating Officer of the large <coughs> law firm. Were those the same kind of questions that you guys were chewing around about how no deal may affect you and the decisions that you would need to take? Yes, I mean, those points resonate for us. It's all about continuity of service. So we provide UK, UK legal advice to our UK and international clients as to other um, legal firms in the sector. And we provide EU law advice. And it's making sure that there's that continuity of service in the event of a no deal Brexit, um, particularly the protection of legal <coughs> professional privilege and rights of audience in the EU courts and institutions. So first and foremost, it's about making sure there's that continuity in the event of a no deal. Um, beyond that, there's wider business planning. And I think I'll break that down into three categories. Firstly, strategic planning. So as I was saying, can we continue to do what we were doing? And actually, in the event of a no deal Brexit, thinking about the impact of a financial downturn. So um, boards looking at their budgets for the year ahead, how would you contingency plan for a downturn? Would that impact on your investment plans more widely for that year? I think secondly, for law firms, it's organisational. Um, actually, EU and UK law firm structures tend to be predicated on single market principles. So there's a number of issues to think about. There's mutual recognition of qualifications. There's freedom of establishment and ownership. So where um, global firms have structures within the EU, can you continue to own those? How do you share profits? Do those partnership models themselves need to change? Can we, as I say, continue to provide advice on EU law? And can we continue to protect clients' legal professional privilege and have rights of audience unchallenged um, across the EU, as I say? So that whole single model now, law firms are having to look at it across 27 individual member states and across the EEA. So I think there's been a huge organisational piece for firms. And that um, resonates with some of the challenges around when do you press the trigger on them? If you have to rewrite your articles or restructure a partnership, that is not an overnight matter. And when do you start having those conversations? And how do you invest money in that? Because boards and um, parent companies are having to um, divert funds towards them, which might be effectively wasted money. So when's the right time to make that call? So I think that resonates across all sectors. And finally, for me in my role, and I look after our support services is making sure that we have continuity of supply across our suppliers so identifying who our critical suppliers are reaching out to them asking them what their brexit contingency plans are um, talking to them about it so then the event of needing to react quickly particularly around the time of the 29th of March knowing that they can continue to provide us with the goods and the services that we need and our clients need and when we talk to them about well, what are the issues you are facing um, a lot of it was around goods so could they import the goods that they needed into the UK was there going to be delays on them but also labour. So our hospitality and catering providers were saying we have a very global workforce. We've got a lot of issues to deal with in terms of immigration and visas and how do we guarantee um, that labour and skills supply. And I think on that there might be a timing point. So these things are unlikely to impact overnight, but actually it's likely to have a longer term 
impact. Ian, in his opening speech, was talking about the immediacy of Dover and the visual impact of that. And, and my view is that on the services side, what we might see is actually it's a longer term impact. So it might unravel over a longer period, but actually it will be equally, if not more complicated and severe, and severe to deal with when it does. So I think it's on sort of a different journey and a different timeline. And so this point that's come up a few times about uh, services being largely neglected so far. Charles, why do you think it is that the defining topic in the cross-party talks is the customs union and there's no sign of services being discussed whatsoever? Well, I mean, I think it is quite bizarre and frustrating for, for I think, a number of sectors, you know, pointing out that you are the majority of the economy but actually not in the debate. I think largely it is actually driven by things like TV pitches. You know, it is still very easy for business journalists to go and you know, report from a factory. You know, it's good pitches versus something uh, versus a services sector. And that's a challenge I think the whole of the services needs to get through. I do think when, when government does start to talk about services, it also is very much focused on financial services, whereas actually the whole rest of the underpinning uh, of the kind of services economy is left out. And for us, uh, one of the things we talk about a lot is the blurring of goods and services it means that it's a sort of arbitrary distinction. I mean, the phone in your pocket is a very, very nice paperweight unless you've got a lot of services attached to it. And I think that needs to be better understood. And for our sector, look, being in a customs union, we have goods members, uh, so lovely, but it's you know, a tenth of the problems that we face. So I think actually the understanding of how you work through it is a lot more complicated. And not largely that's because it's about regulation. And regulation is, you know, takes time to work through file by file every part of the single market, the digital single market for us, uh, and figure out you know, what, is, what is worth having, but also then accepting that, frankly, you're probably going to have to pick or choose either all or none. And finally, I say also for, for tech, our sector is rapidly developing and the regulatory uh, uh, framework around tech is rapidly developing. So often you're not just talking about what's happening now, you're trying to figure out what you're going to be doing in the future. So EU is having big debates around you know, some really difficult things for tech, like e-privacy. UK government's also having difficult conversations around things like how it might want to change limitations to liability, which are hugely concerning to the sector. Uh, but we don't know how they're going to land on those at the moment. And so it's quite hard for government to say to government, you need to do X, Y, and Z. And the thing which a lot of our members talk about when government comes to them and says, well, where do you want alignment? Where do we want divergence? is that there may be areas where divergence could be helpful for making you know, the UK a more friendly home for innovation, particularly around AI. But what we're actually seeing when it comes to domestic legislation is when government does have the ability, it's doing things which are actually restrictive to, to AI. You know, the online harms white paper, for example, you know, while an important issue, actually is very, very restrictive uh, in you know, some quite concerning ways. So you know, quite a lot of our members, even those who were willing to look for the opportunities of, uh, uh, in the, fu the future economic partnership of where you might be able to get some, get some additional advantage, are going, we don't entirely trust the direction you're going, so we'd rather align with the EU, because better the devil you know. Yeah. And Lisa, does that seem right, that of, little, of the little attention that has been given to services, it's gone to financial services, and financial services have done all right? I mean, what's the view on the government's proposal around financial services? Does it feel like its voice has been listened to? <laughs> <laughs> there we go then. <laughs> my, my point is more they just they talk about it when they talk about services. You saw it, you know, in the sorry in the Chequers White Paper uh, parliamentary debate with the Prime Minister. Every time someone said, "But what about services?" she started talking about financial services. And actually, it's a big, big conversation. So, do you feel abandoned then? Well, uh, I mean, I guess in terms of the background here, some of it's been alluded to. If, if, if we think about financial services, it employs well over a million people. Um, it is responsible in 2017 for 6.5% of the creation of value in the UK. It, it is an enormous sector. Um, and in terms of the, the operational model going forward, we're currently operating under a passporting model. There are a number of other options. So equivalents, WTO, trade, uh, WTO terms, or free trade agreement. Um, the industry's view would certainly be that they would prefer to continue the passporting. Um, it offers the widest um, access rights across Europe. It, it's the most efficient approach. Um, it's the most cost effective. Um, the direction of travel has been towards equivalence. Um, equivalence is a much narrower option in which to go into the UK 
Um, as it currently stands, uh, it is not broad enough uh, for our purposes. It doesn't cover um, so some crucial areas of, of banking and deposit taking. Um, it, it's sort of patchy, it's political in terms of how we, we've seen it play out in terms of equivalence decisions for CCPs. It's very long dated, it's, it's tricky. Um, so, so, you know, we're, we're not in, in the ideal position that we would have wished for. Um, I think what we've seen so far is, of course, just sort of very broad brushstrokes around what things might look like going forward. So with a potential withdrawal agreement with a declaration, we've seen statements um, around trying to uh, preserve uh, financial stability, investor protection, um, fair competition, but at the same time um, wanting to retain uh, regulatory and, and, and supervisory autonomy. Um, and, and I think the difficulty is how that will come together going forward. Um, we're certainly in favour of what has been talked about in terms of a close regulatory and supervisory environment. Um, we need a lot more detail as to what that will look like. Adam, do you, audiovisual does yeah. quite well, it's quite big money. Do you ever look across at the fishermen and think, why are you getting <laughs> all of the attention and where are we going wrong? Uh, uh, yeah, most days. <laughs> um, there's a list of sort of tactical problems and mistakes that I think we all made that I, I'm happy to talk about in, in, in excruciating detail. <laughs> um, why didn't we make more um, noise in the media? Uh, you know, it's, I think it's regrettable. I'm just going to say this, it's regrettable that the CBI was so enthusiastic about the deal post checkers when it didn't cover services. But I think the two biggest problems that we had as services were, one, um, as you say, people, people just don't know what services are, or there was a, at least a perception that people don't understand what services are. Uh, you know, I sort of think we might need to have a new rule that all COBA members have to instruct their staff to wear hard hats at their desks and things, and then we can bring journalists around and take lots of snaps. <laughs> so I think, you know, were we to do all this again, were, were, if I were in a sort of Brexit groundhog day, we would want to have a long-term major strategic communications campaign to articulate the massive value of services to the UK and you know you'd start that from day, day one after the referendum I think post checkers it was kind of too late for that I think the other thing though to be fair is services getting services in a deal with the EU is really really hard it's harder than manufacturing because for services you certainly for broadcasting you need something that's close to the single market it could be Norway you need something one of these off-the-shelf models that's very close to the single market <coughs> Um, otherwise, as we've seen, Macron's already said he'll exercise the cultural exception, broadcasting won't be in any, any um, bespoke deal. And so it's really, really hard. Um, it's, and it's harder than manufacturing because to get into the single market, then you've got the conversation about freedom of movement. And this is a question, I think, when it push came to the shove, the, the, the government decided that you know, that's freedom of movement is the red line. We're not willing to make whatever massive concession we will have to make in order to get services in that deal in any meaningful way. Um, and I think you know, we were, at that point, thrown under the bus. I think if we'd have had a longer, you know, bigger campaign uh, in the run-up to that, it would have been harder to have thrown us under the bus, but it would still have been a, you know, a, a, t a close call, I think. And Emma, the, from a lawyer's perspective, yes. I think lawyers uh, individually may seem to do quite well out of Brexit, but do you feel like that the profession will, uh, is having its voice heard and will have its voice heard in the next phase? I think as we were saying, goods are tangible, they're immediate, so I think there is much more of a challenge with services. Um, I think with services, we've got to look ahead actually, because there's a lot of discussion around the exit terms. And actually, the way in which we will understand how services are going to be predicated is all around the future relationships. So I think I'd encourage some focus around that. And from our perspective, um, the lawyer's directive, um, that being maintained, would be you know, very helpful, really important to us. So actually, and I think it's happening. My sense is that government's probably consulting with people more um, individually behind closed doors. There's 
probably one, there's less public forums and discussions around it in the way that we talk about there's lots of noise and attention to good. So I think it's happening, but there's a real need for focus on what that future looks like. So we have the continuity of service that I was talking about. Um, lots of practicalities, as we know, um, within different bars, within different EU countries as to how these things will actually operate. And certainly the Law Society of England and Wales and the City of London Law Society have been working very hard to support members. Um, the international team at the Law Society of England and Wales have been having a number of meetings and um, with various local bars to establish working relationships going forward. So I think it's essential that that continues and we get some momentum behind that and that government actively supports keeping that market open for the legal services sector. Ian talked about the value of it. I think it's really important to all of us that we maintain London as a centre of legal excellence, um, that the UK itself and being a jurisdiction of choice that that is maintained. So I think we have to look forward to those objective aims. What is it we need to achieve? And then what is it that we need to do to get there? I think that will be fundamentally important. And if you assume that we're leaving the single market, um, which is certainly the government stated position, um, what does that mean for you as the CEO of a COO of a law firm in terms of the way you're structured and the way you're set up? What will you have to do to change the way you operate if you take that as the base case? Sure. So for us, um, it's around making sure that we can continue to advise EU law and that we have rights of access in those EU courts and institutions. So we set up um, recently as a Brexit contingency option, a partnership in Ireland. Um, one of the things that we are looking properly to understand is how the existing what's commonly talked about fly in, fly out will work. I mean, actually, the US lawyers have been doing that for ages, using um, the UK as a gateway into the EU. But how will that work? Um, post us leaving the EU is going to be very important. So for me, it's that structuring piece. It's the, have we got rights of audience? Can we protect privilege? Have we got continuity of advice? So of course, we've done our contingency planning on that. I think one of the challenges for lawyers is lawyers like certainty, certainty of outcome. And as we know, Brexit isn't that. So it's very hard to plan and actually press go on those restructuring options until you know what the final position is. So I think that will be welcomed and then we and other law firms can go about finalising our structures. I think there's also linked to it a challenge around momentum. Um, like with any project, you need that momentum to get something delivered. And uh, this has been picked up, put down, it's being slightly changed, it's nuanced along the way. And actually when you get that loss of momentum and effort, it's very hard. So we're about to enter another period, as you say, between now and, and possibly the 31st of October. So I think one of the things I have to do as others is think about, well, what does that planning look like and how do we get that energy and impetus? And how do we continue to do the rest of our jobs as well? So one of the challenges for us just at the end of March, we were opening an office in Edinburgh, is do we need to divert resources from that project to be doing more in Dublin or elsewhere? So I think there's that constant battle of what's required how are you best prepared and also it's not all about us it's very important that we're reaching out to our clients to understand that they know what they need to be doing to prepare for Brexit themselves and that we can guide them through that and a lot of the challenges that I might face in my role will be very common to what a COO in any sector or industry will be facing so I think working together is very important as well sharing ideas and best practice and working it's in everyone's interest to work collectively on that. And you mentioned your uh, office was supposed to open on the 29th of March but then got delayed till the 12th of April. Yes well that was practical <laughs> completion of the bill so it was so tracking still Brexit. Now it is yes. open. Um, what I would say I remember offices open and our Brexit journey continues. Um, <laughs> along the way it was um, actually quite interesting in terms of no deal because one of the issues we faced in January and the builders were starting their work is that where everyone was going about their good Brexit contingency planning you couldn't get a piece of timber for love nor money because everyone was stockpiling it. So it was having very direct impact on construction <laughs> projects. So um, yes, that was adding to my woes at the time and, um, and to others. So I think there was very real and immediate impacts about some of the contingency planning people were doing. Adam, Emma mentioned the UK's role as a kind of gateway to the single market. I mean, mm -hmm. that's also true in audiovisual, right? And do you think that is changing, has already changed? Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, yes, it is definitely changing. Um, to what extent is, is really, um, I don't think anyone actually knows um, uh, yet. So, you know, the, the thing with services in particular, I guess, but the thing with Brexit is sort of change doesn't happen in one go. It's a sort of drip, drip, drip effect where you know, on day one, company makes sure they've got the new legal license in another country, maybe a small adjustment in their operations to support that. 
And then that starts to sort of get bigger and bigger over time um, as the UK loses critical mass and the Netherlands or um, Germany's another destination for a lot of companies uh, gains critical mass. So you, you've got one impact on day one and then I think the real impact is about the UK's position globally as Europe and it's, it's currently in, and has been for a while as Europe's leading broadcasting centre. We're home to about a third of all channels in the EU. A third of all channels in the EU are licensed in the UK. Half of those are international and will now be licensed in other countries. And so the question is, you know, I'm Amsterdam. Uh, I've got Netflix already. Um, I have, I'm not going to name the names um, because Bloomberg are here and I know it will just be, uh, uh, Joe will report um, that, but uh, you already know, you know various companies have uh, set up in Amsterdam already, got the licenses there. Um, they will start to build their own critical mass. They've already got a nice tech hub, they all speak English, they've got a great airport. So far, people haven't wanted to be there because the media sector is so small compared to the UK. But that'll start to change as broadcasters and service companies start to move there to sort of you know, um, support their clients. And you'll get this conversation in, in a boardroom, you know, there's, there's so much restructuring going on in the sector at the moment of companies buying everyone and so much disruption from new media and on demand that companies are always changing and looking to, you know, basically to reduce their costs and to be more efficient. And you're going to have a conversation in five years in most poor rooms that be, well, explain to me, why have we got this base in the UK and, and the Netherlands or Germany? Why, why, why was that again? Oh, well, we wanted to sort of minimise the uh, disruption at the time. Right, and I'm spending how much? I'm duplicating what costs am I exactly duplicating here? And the Netherlands will say, you know, come to us because, you know, we've, we've got all these things now and we can give you something the UK can't. We can give you a licence. And I'm not saying that everyone will move to the Netherlands, but you have a conversation where previously it's been a no-brainer to go to the UK. So it's about the UK's long-term position as a global broadcasting powerhouse. Is that the same in financial services, at least? I mean, you being here and State Street being here is kind of testament to the UK's strength and its access into the single market, but is that likely to change? I think we're starting to see things change already and it is a question of how that will change over time, perhaps over the next 10 years. Um, it, it, some similar themes here, but in terms of setting up in different European countries, I mean, we've already seen probably 100 financial institutions set up in Ireland, uh, about 60 in Luxembourg, probably about 40 in both of, of, of France and Germany. So. <laughs> Over time, the UK has perhaps influenced, had a sort of a disproportionately heavy influence in terms of financial services, and we are starting to see a sort of a, a more multipolar approach uh, to financial services um, with, with other countries benefiting, obviously, in terms of their ability to provide the passport. Um, if we have some kind of transition which involves a... a, a, a um, uh, well, a transition period will have a, probably a degree of standstill where we'll continue to operate in a similar way, say, till the end of 2020. But over time, it will be a question of how that pattern continues to play out um, when we see that regulators are talking about having a lot of substance and decision makers on the ground. Um, they are um, specific about outsourcing arrangements and restricting scopes of outsourcing arrangements. So while we've only seen perhaps comparatively a small amount of, say, jobs relocate to European countries at the moment, the direction of travel is that that will increase, um, that there will be more assets, more people, more services moving over time. Um, and of course, you know, again, traditionally, um, the UK has, has been the main hub for, for the provision of FX, uh, for cross-border lending, um, for, for Euro clearing, um, a $280 billion business. It, it's hard to see that that will continue to be the case going forward. Giles, I wanted to talk to you about immigration, which is obviously one of the big concerns when you speak to uh, service industries about access to talent and people. And while... Um, the lawyers and uh, the bankers may struggle slightly less with the three hundred, uh, the thirty thousand pounds salary cap um, for people. You know, if you're trying to attract people to come and set up a business in the UK, 
Is that a big challenge, the government's proposals on immigration? Uh, I certainly think it is, but just very quickly to go back to the previous question, I think yeah. that shop window point's really, really important more generally. I mean, for tech, for example, the vast majority of da data cables come into the UK for Europe from, from the US. And actually, you know, we have come a data market. About 11.5% of global data flows go through the, go through the UK. 75% of that is with the EU. What happens, you know, when suddenly it's not enabled to be a place where you can house yourself? and to deliver for the EU becomes quite difficult. And migration is another part of that, of those building blocks. The sector has done incredibly well out of building ecosystems where it's an exciting place, particularly London, Cambridge, Oxford, uh, as places for people to want to come, to take a bit of a risk, particularly in that startup sector where you, know, you come across on possibly a low salary, but maybe getting uh, an equity stake. Um, how does that translate into a 30,000 pound cap? It's quite difficult. And also, it has a wider impact on the, on the sector as a whole, because uh, if you think about the infrastructure and the kind of delivery of broadband, for example, across the UK to make the UK a successful place uh, across the board for tech, you know, the people putting fibre optic cable in the road aren't on those kind of salaries. If you don't have them, then actually the basic infrastructure will deteriorate compared to our competitors, and that will present a challenge as well. And finally, I think one of the key things about a lot, of, uh, a lot of people who work in tech more generally is that their the kind of age demographic's quite young, uh, very, very mobile, very internationally mobile, and do have a, to a greater or lesser extent, a kind of a sense of internationalism about them. So thinking about restrictive immigration, or even if it doesn't impact them, they think about what it does to their friends, their family, their communities, and maybe that changes their minds. And you've seen this a little bit in some of the data coming through. So for example, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, a website called Hide.com does a survey of US programmers about where they would go elsewhere in the world to, uh, to work you know, if they weren't in the US. The UK is number one for every year they've done it. Uh, in, uh, after 2016, we dropped to sixth with Canada shooting up to the top and it's stayed roughly there ever since. And actually, that's, you know, that means it's much harder to attract people across. The key thing also, it's worth saying, is the big companies, you know, the name brand kind of tech giants, will still be able to pay the salaries, get people in. But everyone else becomes a little bit harder, and that's actually where the bulk of UK tech is. Those mid-tier successful firms working things like payments, uh, working, you know, working things like CRM, those kind of issues. Can they get the same people they need to compete to create new innovation, create new products, which then continue to allow them to be internationally competitive? So if, Jumping on immigration. Uh, yes, um, I think it's important also to say that this is not, for us anyway, it's not about a training gap. This is not about yeah. British citizens being sort of deprived of, of jobs. I mean, we've got 600 odd international channels that are broadcasting into EU countries from the UK. And to do that, you need people who understand those markets, who speak Latvian and understand the Latvian advertising market and have relationships with um, buyers there and platforms there. Um, when we surveyed the COBA membership, what came, I was quite surprised actually that only 15% of staff are from the EU um, and there's an extra sort of 4% from um, non-EU, non-UK countries. So it's just under 20% are sort of foreign nationals, which I, I, I thought quite low, bearing in mind how, how many international channels there are. And I think what happens there is someone from Latvia comes in and that creates jobs for UK people because the people around them, the lawyers, the backroom staff, the compliance people, the regulatory people, technicians, are British. So I just wanted to make, you, to make that point. So before we go to questions from the floor, so get your questions ready, I want to do a quick uh, round the panel of what you see as the opportunities from Brexit. So to start with you, Giles, because whenever ministers are on the airwaves talking about the opportunities from Brexit, they almost always say AI, which I'd never know if it's because people like me don't really understand it and it sounds plausible, <laughs> or because that is actually this big opportunity that could be there outside of the European Union that wasn't if we'd stayed in. Well, this kind of goes back to my earlier point in some ways, that uh, in the Chequers white paper, you know, it does talk about, well, we need to have flexibility for these new developing industries, even if that means trade-off for market access. When we speak to our members, that's not what they say. About 60% of them, when we surveyed them, said we want you know, as close as possible alignment with the EU you know, in order to get market access. We don't want the flexibility. So there are things you could do. I mean, you know, if we're looking at things like e-privacy, were that to come in, that does really restrict your ability to do certain levels of processing to develop AI. But fundamentally, 
you're going to end up having to sell to the EU market anyway. There's EU, there's US, there's China. Those are the three regulatory poles. The worst thing you could do would be different from one of those three. Yeah. And do we have the political appetite in the UK to have a US-style uh, level of data protection, of, uh, of, kind of uh, protection online, all those kind of things? I don't think so, and certainly that's not what we see from the political debate. So it's pretty hard, hard to see, if I'm honest. I think where we can be successful, uh, should we wish to do so, is first of all, working very hard at a global level, were we to take a seat at the WTO to try and sort out global infrastructure on things like free flow of data, uh, things like technology transfer to open up new markets, that's possible. It's a 20 year long, slow technical process, it's not an overnight success. And I think the other thing we can look at doing far better, and this doesn't, by the way, require us to leave the EU, is how do you deliver the processes that sit behind the regulation. So, you know, can you improve the way that we, uh, that we interpret things like GDPR? Can we make sure that we are as razor sharp on the way we do things as possible and helping our kind of wide business environment rather than saying, well, we need to junk everything EU, close ourselves off to what is kind of a you know, big part of our market in order for not very much to happen. A good example of this, by the way, is, is GDPR itself. Yeah. So very early on in the Brexit debate, there were lots of uh, people saying, well, we can abandon GDPR so we can do a trade deal with the US. All the US uh, major tech firms have adopted GDPR globally because you don't want to break up data sets, so you need them all operating on a one data protection framework. On that basis, they were going to you know, the UK government and the US government going, we don't want you to change it. We've just spent millions of pounds putting this in place. Please leave it alone, and that's actually you have heard government listening to that now is in a much more sensible place. Elisa, financial services, new trade deals, opening up new markets, are there big opportunities there? Are there other opportunities in financial services outside the European Union? Well, I guess we've heard very recently Andrew Bailey, um, the head of the FCA, talk about a situation where there might be a potentially lower burden in terms of an approach to financial services. So more an approach where we uh, look at outcomes as opposed to rules, uh, a flexible, principle-based approach as opposed to a, perhaps a more tighter rules-based approach. Um, and again, in, in the context of equivalence, there's talks about perhaps us having a more competitive regime, something more similar to, to the US, to Singapore, to Shanghai. Um, at the moment, it seems there is still a, an underlying tension between whether we align or whether we diverge. Um, and it's, it's quite difficult to know exactly how that will pan out. Um, some of the principles we, we've seen here, you know, on one hand, can we be more competitive? But on the other hand, um, as soon as we move away from the EU framework, um, any equivalence as it currently stands would be called into question. Um, and again, there's a lot more clarity that we need around how a new equivalent system will work, if and how it can be withdrawn, what the dispute resolution mechanisms mm. are around it. Um, there's still that residual Defense, question yeah. about creating a multipolar financial system with people, assets and resources over time moving to different, different jurisdictions now that they will be able to provide the passport. So we'll see over time as to how it plays out. Yeah. And Adam, you've talked about the risks. Mm. Are there opportunities for the audiovisual sector? Well, it's interesting. I think the, the audiovisual sector is quite split, actually. On We've all done our responses to the government, you know, asking for their initial, initial views on a trade deal with the US. And I think there's, there's a real sort of split down the middle um, because... I mean, the UK is a very protected market. You know, you've, in, in broadcasting, you've got the BBC, you've got lots of quotas to make um, domestic content, to make European content. Um, and I think there are um, understandable concerns from the sort of the public service, public s sector side of the television sector um, about the UK potentially tra trading those away with, with the US. Um, for my, I must say, I, I have not seen any indication from the US that they particularly want to do that, but the, nevertheless, the, the, the concern is there. Um, that said, and I, I mean, we we think there is an opportunity to a point in a, in a trade deal with the US because there's nothing particularly that we want, you know, there's no barriers to the US market that we're trying to um, reduce or anything like that. But I th we think we could do, if the UK and the US as the two biggest exporters globally of IP were able to uh, 
construct the gold standard uh, trade deal for IP protection. We hope that that would be quite an interesting precedent for future trade deals, particularly with China. So we think there is something, something there. Um, whether that's, you know, in terms of economic terms, well, I suppose long term, were you to actually get the deal with China, uh, that would have huge benefits. Um, whether that would uh, outweigh the, uh, the negative impacts of, of no deal, whatever, with the EU is another matter. Emma, opportunities. Yes. Burgess Salmon, have you got a kind of opportunities and risk register? What's, what's on the opportunities? Yeah. Absolutely. So we've talked a lot about some of the challenges and issues that we face, and we mustn't lose sight of those um, opportunities. We know that life is going to be complex for all of our clients. I think for us, it's really important um, that we're scenario planning what are the things that might affect clients and when so that they get the best advice from the right people. So for us, internally thinking about, well, where's our expertise and the directory of that so that all our lawyers have access to it and can point people to help clients and their solutions because um, we remain on this Brexit journey, there's a lot of contingency planning going on. At some point in time when there's a finite outcome, clients will be trying to buy, sell businesses, structure contracts, do deals and it's making sure that they have um, the right advice at that time so that their business interests are uh, managed with continuity in the best way possible. And of course longer term you can perceive that there'll be new work opportunities, international trade and so on. So I think it's both what are those future opportunities in the new landscape, whatever that looks like, and then how do you help clients through their immediate needs and help them to deliver their commercial imperatives. Okay, great. So we'll go to questions from the floor. So we've got one, David, right next to you there. I'm, I'm, my name is David Lee, in the House of Lords. As some years ago, we all remember Bill Clinton saying, it's the economy, stupid. This morning, what's coming across me is the single market, stupid. Now, how the hell does it take so long to get anybody to say that? I mean, people in Westminster, I mean, listen to other people, and they have not been saying, now, there could be an opportunity, just about an opportunity, under the new political relationship, etc., 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 to get on with this. But could the panel just comment on yeah. how they're going to get? It's the single market, stupid. It's not services, stupid. It's the single market, stupid. Because it's going to be translated into language politicians can understand. And we'll take a couple more questions because there's quite a few hands came up. David, do you want to pass on here? Thank you, Stephen Timms. I'm on the Brexit Select Committee in, in the Commons. The, the panel all sound quite gloomy. What I'm wondering is, will, would they be significantly less gloomy if we were to leave on the basis of the Prime Minister's deal, or is it any kind of Brexit which precipitates this gloom? Um, we've got one right at the back. Uh, assuming, this is Joe Mays from Bloomberg, and um, assuming Britain leaves the single market as discussed, could the panellists paint a picture of what the services relationship between the UK and the EU is most likely to look like on day one of the future relationship after the transition period? Okay, so who wants to start with responses to those? It's the single market, stupid. Uh, is the Prime Minister's deal making you any less gloomy and what should the future relationship look like? I can do the first two. Okay. okay. about the last one, Joe, I really don't. Um, 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 on the, sing the single market point, I mean, yes. Uh, I think, you know, to be fair, when you go back into, it seems like so long ago, but we go back to the Mansion House speech when the Prime Minister, I mean, you know, I, she talked about broadcasting for two or three paragraphs of that speech and then went on Andrew Marr the next day and explained to him the country of origin principle, which frankly, I, I was, you know, I mean, in our house, my cat understands the country of origin principle now, but, you know, she, they, they I'm, I'm, I mean, no doubt that our concerns were recognised. The problem was, in reality, when it came down to the negotiation with the EU, the EU said, well, if you want to have services, then you're going to have to accept freedom of movement. And... The rest, well, we, we all know the rest. Um, 
The, in terms of the, the transition period, uh, sorry, in terms of the deal, that's <laughs> Freudian slip there, uh, in terms of the deal, it's uh, on the table, it really means nothing to broadcasting uh, long term. There's nothing in it for us. French will play the cultural exception, broadcasting will be excluded. The one thing that is useful is a transition period, and I don't want to you know, underplay that. The transition period is useful because at the moment, People have got their licenses, They've done, they're going through the legal processes. Some companies have relocated staff, but not all. And they'll be able to slow that down. It's, you could argue it's delaying the inevitable, but I think it's also um, treating those people, those staff, with respect, as much respect as possible here, um, and allowing that to be done in an orderly process. So a transition period would be very welcome. I think trying to take some of those points in a combined answer. I think the point rather than gloom is our trying to convey a sense of there is a lot to do and that there's been a lot of attention on goods and what we now need is that equivalent attention on services. And to the deal point, I think actually it's all about the future arrangements. So we're talking a lot of focusing on a deal and the exit arrangement, but what will things look like in future uh, will predicate how things work. And my sense is back to our point of the immediacy of Dover versus services. I think lawyers will still be flying around the EU the day after. I think it will take time. So I think there will be no, um, I may well be proved to be wrong, but I don't anticipate a discernible difference on day one. I think it will start to evolve as people start to transform translate the requirements as the individual bars start to vocalise and set out different rules and regulations about how things will work. And I think that will be part of the problem. There won't be one common position. It will be a number of different positions and regulations to grapple with. So I think it will become more disparate and less unified in that sense in terms of the provision. So our challenge will be making sure that um, international legal service to clients is as seamless and integrated as it can be in that backdrop. Charles, you want to do? Yeah. So, so a couple of things. Why, why are people not saying this is quite stupid? I mean, partly this is also worth pointing out the Northern Ireland question, which is the customs union is the is the challenge to sort out the Northern Ireland problem. Yeah. Yeah. Single market doesn't really apply to that, and a lot of the discussion, particularly on the Conservative backbenches, has been about that. I think that's been part of the challenge. Uh, as Adam said previously, also this question of freedom of movement. Now, for businesses, this is a difficult one because. You know, businesses are perfectly happy keeping a freedom, freedom of movement. In fact, there would probably be a preference for doing so, mm -hmm. but recognise the, the viewpoint after the referendum that you know, that was a tricky place for businesses to kind of try and plant their flag, and I think that created some challenges. However, in answer to the kind of third question, where, what do I think the final deal will look like? I mean, bluntly, I think we end up in something which looks an awful lot like having the customs union and something which looks an awful lot like the single market, because when you ask businesses and actually get into the detail, where do people want divergence, they're pretty few and far between. And if you're forced to pick between models by the end of this process, I think that's where we could well end up. In terms of the political declaration, it, frankly, everything is open there. You can read what, whatever you want into that, so a lot of businesses aren't really focused on what's in there. I think my view on the, um, you know, should we be positive or gloomy about the withdrawal agreement itself? There are some really important things in the withdrawal agreement. So, for example, for tech, uh, Title Seven, which is about legacy data, is something which has to be cleared up, and the withdrawal agreement gives you that. That's really, really important. And the other thing is the transition period. You know, that is that is something that all businesses fought incredibly hard for. My worry at the moment is it's a rapidly diminishing asset because if we don't leave until the 31st of October. That means without the one-year extension, which is possible to the transition period, there are 14 months left to negotiate the much more complicated part of this process. And to give you an idea of the challenges there, an adequacy agreement to allow the free flow of data, the fastest one ever done with the EU was 18 months. For 14 months with a future prime minister who may or may not want to trigger a year-long extension gives an awful lot of people in my sector you know, significant nerves. One of the things we'd really like to see coming out of the... You know, the Labour cross party talk, the, the current cross party talks is, you know, is there a clear commitment to say, first of all, we're going to use that one year additional extension because we're going to have to, and frankly, do we actually have to start talking to you about whether this transition is long enough to begin with? Because I suspect it's not going to be. Yeah, I, I'd echo those points. I think, you know, maybe we haven't been heard or the message hasn't got a, across as much because of some of these issues around sympathies and empathies and, and where they sit, and obviously, you know, moving medicine across borders is much more visual and it's uh, kind of immediately digestible to people than, than financial services and, and lawyers and, uh, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, 
we definitely don't want uh, a no-deal Brexit. We would like some kind of orderly transition, a good transition period, so everyone can find their feet and work out what they're doing. Um, so, again, maximising that time for everybody is, is got, got to be a good thing, essentially. I can actually think of two things to Joe's question. Actually, while I've been sitting here, the, the, the long term, you know, what does that future relationship look like? Uh, um, if certainly for the audio visual sector, I think there's going to be a lot more fragmentation in the European market. You know, London, UK has been this massive hub for broadcasting. People are always asking, well, where, where's, where's everyone going? Are they going to the Netherlands? Are they going to Germany? Are they going to the Czech Republic? Are they going to Spain? The answer is they're going to all of them because it's happened on a really fairly random basis, you know, where they might have a presence already, that's where they've decided to sort of put, get new licenses and build out their operations slightly. So you're seeing fragmentation of the broadcasting sector, um, which will mean increased costs for everyone, that will mean diverting resources away from all the exciting stuff like investing in content and innovation and things. So it's not good news, I don't think, for the European broadcasting sector. Um, uh, and the second thing I think is there are going to, there's any number of regulatory challenges that are coming out of the woodwork now that we had no idea about, I think, two or three years ago. You look at, I think there's going to be a lot more what I call remote regulation, where there are under certain parts of European law, I won't get into the, the nitty gritty of it, but you can get a license from a country um, according to what satellites you are carried on. And that will, turns out it happens to be Luxembourg. Everyone's on a satellite that's owned by a Luxembourg company. So they're all going to be regulated by Luxembourg. And under that particular clause, you don't have to move anyone. You don't have to have a presence in that country. So Luxembourg, it was going to be sitting there regulating, I don't know how many it's going to be. It could be scores. It could be one or two hundred channels, which will still be based in the UK. And um, for various reasons, they will tend to be really, really tiny um, channels. There won't be UK um, COBRA members, but tiny channels, uh, many of which are over a third broadcasting in sort of minority languages. So Luxembourg is going to have to staff up at the regulator with plenty of Arabic, Urdu uh, put speakers, Pashto as well, um, in order to oversee them. And they'll be broadcasting not just to Luxembourg, but across the, the EU as well. So this will be an issue potentially for countries across the EU. So uh, th there are more. Russian propaganda channels, uh, Russian news channels, do very well out of Brexit um, because they're the only channels that actually don't need to get a licence from the EU because they, they can stay in the UK. They can use something called the European Convention, which um, applies to everyone, but no one else will use it apart from the Russian news channels um, because... Uh, it, it doesn't cover advertising very well, so no one who carries advertising wants to use it. Um, it doesn't cover certain other countries, uh, and it doesn't cover on-demand, so if you've got any on-demand service, which is pretty much every broadcaster today, you don't want to use it. But if you're a Russian news channel with no on-demand service and no advertising, you're very happy to use it, not only um, because you don't have to change anything, but it also means you don't come under the jurisdiction of the European Commission. You come under something called the Council of Europe, which meets once every five years to look at these things and doesn't have any executive in the, in anywhere near the European Commission. So it's good news for Russian news. Next batch of questions. We've got one down here and then there's two over here, David. Um, hi, I'm Jill Rush. I work here. I want to ask a question about the risks of being a rule taker. Uh, under something like, for example, the Common Market 2.0 uh, ideas that people had if we stay in the single market. We've talked a lot about the desire to remain close to EU regulation now, but I just wonder if you might look forward to how EU regulation might develop without UK influence and whether you think you'd still want to be closely aligned to that future regime. Do you want to pass to Sophia as well? Hi, I'm Sophia Wolpis from London First. Um, we've heard lots about how um, service is going to be happy to have the transition phase, but also how it's quite unclear 
what the deal after the transition phase will look like. So how will services actually use the transition phase when until the very end of that it's not going to be clear where the actual deal is going to land. So is that phase just going to be used to still withhold all the investment um, or will it just mean preparing for kind of like a slow no deal? David, there's two over here. Uh, Mark Berliat, apologies for heckling earlier on financial services, <laughs> uh, but the government policy is that we should be a third country like Peru. Equivalence is not a negotiated issue, it's what the EU offers. The question following other ones is clearly the industry has either not been listened to by government or it may have been, <coughs> listened, sorry, it's been listened to but its views have not been taken into account. Is there more the industries could have done or are we now, a question for the Institute, in a, um, a fact-free environment in respect of policy making. David Hanney, House of Lords. Uh, I wonder if the panel, each member of the panel, simply addressing the sector which they work in could answer a simple question. Is there any alternative to membership that is better? Okay, so what are the risks of being a rule taker? How are you going to use the transition? Uh, what more could you have done as an industry and what model other than EU membership is better? Start with you, Giles. Sure. So uh, starting with the raw taker uh, question, this is a really difficult one. And actually, I think a lot of the sector's uh, view on this has evolved over, over time. Uh, there is fundamentally a challenge with being a rule taker. But given that in tech, where you're going to have to sell into the EU market and where you put something on the internet, it's going to have to be compliant because you can sort of access it pretty much anywhere. They're going to be rule takers anyway, is their view. Even regulation that we deeply, deeply dislike from the EU, which currently exists, for example, the Copyright Directive recently passed, which is really problematic for our sector, a lot of our members go, well, we're going to have to abide by it anyway. So actually their question is, how do we influence in a Norway-style approach uh, um, kind of in, you know, in Brussels, rather than saying, well, we can try and do something fundamentally different. The other side of that is, again, you know, this kind of question of better the devil you know, where if you're not sure where the UK might go and might do something actually you know, significantly worse, if, you know, you know, if current evidence is, is anything to be believed, you know, it might not be the worst thing in the world to be a rule taker from something which is a little bit more so um, uh, in the way they work. A lot of this will depend a little bit on the next commission, actually. I think that will change views as well. If you have a more protectionist commission, if France manages to solidify its basis, um, you know, uh, particularly with Merkel uh, standing down, it, things might change again, but it is a long-term <coughs> problem. The other thing I'd say is also that often we hear about, uh, you know, about kind of wanting to access new markets because they're the growth sectors. Well, for something like autonomous vehicles, everywhere is a growth sector because it doesn't exist yet. And so actually, you may as well be looking at the big markets which are already you know, well capitalised as places you want to be. So you're going to have to abide by their rules. Uh, Sophia, on um, you know, what will services uh, look like after the transition phase? Part of this, I think, is actually um, what we're really keen to see from government is how they're going to run the transition phase. And it worries me a little bit that... Uh, you know, speaking to civil servants, they're going, well, we want to use the time till October to figure out exactly where we're going to be and how we're going to run the next process. Well, if we we're already supposed to have left by now, surely this is stuff which could have been done previously. You know, what are the NDA processes which are going to be set up so that businesses can be inputting directly into that process? How is government going to set up its own negotiation team? And the big question is, are they going to go file by file through the, you know, through the single market, going which ones do we want to align with, which don't we? Or are they going to take a very top-down umbrella approach of that are we really talking about the single market or not? That's not clear, and that gives businesses uh, uh, some pause. Uh, well, Tani, kind of, uh, is there an alternative to EU membership? The tech sector was overwhelmingly Remain, uh, and you know, frankly, that you know, there was a reason for that. There is probably a way you can be a really innovative digital economy outside the EU, but it requires you to spend a lot of time fundamentally changing your economic position. If you want to be a Singapore in the Atlantic. You can try and do that, but you can't do it over the space of two years, and it has to be a far bigger conversation, frankly, with society about the type of regulatory appetite and protections we want to see as a country than I think anyone is particularly having. So if you're going to continue to be a, you know, frankly, a European-style democracy with the levels of protection that we would all expect across a whole range of industries, then it's pretty hard to see. If you want to say, look, we're going to slash and burn 
workers' rights and you know, environmental regulation and you know, data protection, etc., 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 you could probably do something which is quite innovative. I'm just not sure that anyone really wants to do so. Lisa. Sure. Um, on the rule-taking point, I guess for financial services, we've sort of spent 40 years getting as close as possible um, to, to the rest of the European countries. So there is a, an alignment of interest, certainly at the moment, in terms of how financial services work. Um, there's a big question about this transition period and what do things look like later. Um, all we've got at the moment is, is really broad outlines of a, a sort of a theoretical um, a system where we've got close regulatory and supervisory cooperation, but at the same time, um, there, there is this opportunity for a regulatory and decision-making autonomy, um, and it, it's really difficult to see what that's going to look like, and we could really do with more indications as to how a new equivalence system, which in the way it's being talked about will be bespoke, will look like, so that we can start to plan accordingly. Otherwise, you know, again, it, you know, there's a transition and a cliff edge in effect, because we don't know anything until the last minute. Um, is there a better alternative? Um, you know, the, the four methods um, of access as they currently stand are passporting, WTO, free trade agreement and equivalence. The best of those, as things currently stand, is definitely passporting. Um, we're now moving to a situation of equivalence. Um, equivalence needs um, to be altered uh, to suit the situation that it's now currently trying to, to solve for. Um, so, so the short answer is no. So, right, <clears throat> a, few a, few, a few points. Um, on the question about is there anything outside the EU that is better, um, there are things that are comparable for us in our sort of narrow view of what we need, things like Norway, uh, but is there anything that's better? Uh, no. The, uh, in the audiovisual sector, we, know, we have to remember the UK is home to a third of all EU channels, and that's, the, uh, that's happened because of the e EU rules and EU membership because they're able to get licensed uh, by Ofcom. So you know, we, we've done very well out of that arrangement and it's, it, it's hard to see anything better outside the um, uh, single market for broadcasting. That said, I don't want to, you know, the, the UK is still going to be a globally strong, one of the world's leading audiovisual sectors. Um, even without um, EU membership, it's just a question of um, could it have been even better. Um, on the subject of EU rules, I think um, there are there are tensions. The UK is sort of, I suppose, around the EU table, one of the more um, open market um, countries, along with countries perhaps like the Netherlands, um, and whereas uh, France and others would prefer to have more levies and quotas and things on, on companies. But the reality, and I got asked this at the, um, at the uh, Brexit Select Committee, and the reality is that the UK just gold plates these rules. So actually, the, the, the EU is, is so flexible. Um, we, we, could re, we could reduce the amount of advertising tomorrow if we wanted, even within, by staying in the EU. Uh, we uh, have restrictions on advertising uh, uh, and other areas far in excess of the EU minimum requirements. So. To be honest, um, at today there isn't anything that I would want to change, and, and if we did, we, it's not it's not EU membership that's stopping us doing it. Um, I think what else was there? There was uh, what it, what would we do differently? I think was was a question. Um, what can yeah. we do? Yeah. So I think we need a long term strategic communications campaign to put services on the map generally, not for just for Brexit, but for whatever the next Brexit problem is, um, so that people understand that this is what, um, this is the contribution services make to the UK. If there are any services um, sectors out there uh, that would like to be part of that, then please do let me know. Um, uh, and then there was something on, on the transition period and how it's chilling investment. I, I know, I mean, look, I would rather have a transition period than not have a transition period, much rather have it. Um, but yeah, you know, it's sort of like lots of mini transition periods, isn't it? It's like there's a, the deadline gets extended and the deadline gets extended and you're never quite sure how long it's going to last. Um, and it is chilling. It's not just about sort of people relocating into the EU. You know, I have one member that was saying they wanted to bring 
part of their production operations into the UK from, from one of the EU member states, and they put that on hold because they're not certain what the conditions are going to be for that. So it's, um, it's cutting both ways. Thank you. Yes, to try and deal with those in the rounds, I certainly support the points around sort of visibility of the services sector. Ian started this talk by talking about the value of the UK legal um, sector, and I think it's important that we can find a way to make that real and express that in terms that people understand so that there's a real imperative. Um, and to answer the questions about is there anything better, it's very difficult to opine on that at the moment. We may have to regroup to do that because we're very much at the start of the journey, as we say. What I would say, as I said at the beginning, is that a number of law firm models are predicated on single market principles. So there is a very real and big task for firms to restructure that if that is the way um, that we go. Um, I think you raise a very good point, Sophia, that we must make sure that inertia doesn't creep in. One of the challenges around this mobilise, stand down, new day, remobilise is that that can become a distraction and actually you still have to address the fundamental issues. So I think it's important that organisations will need to continue to use that time to plan effectively. And back to where I started, um, there is a lot to be done in terms of understanding what that services structure looks like. And there is a headwind against us because we know that free trade agreements, WTO terms are again predicated towards goods rather than services. So my sense is it has a long way to run. Yeah, that point on transition, I heard something government said, we managed to march business up the hill once. I don't think we're going to be able to do it again last minute in October. Uh, unfortunately, I think that's all we've got time for. Uh, so all that's left is to thank Burgess Salmon as our partner and our excellent panellists uh, and to plug our next Brexit event next Thursday uh, on how to improve the way the next phase of negotiations will run, which talks to some of these <laughs> questions. So thank you very much to the panel. Thank you.